I just want to start talking about the, the way you became a filmmaker. The normal path for filmmakers is from cinema schools or audiovisual environment. But in your case, you came from the world of art. How does that define you as a director? Um, well, I think the first influences were, um, were both um, art, art um, <clears throat> Uh, my art teacher in junior high school, so I was quite young, um, 13 and 14. Uh, at the same time, there was an English professor who was um, showing films for some, for some reason. He was, he was having us read these great books like uh, Waiting for Godot and um, uh, Lord of the Flies. Um, and at the same time, he was showing us experimental films from the Canadian Film Board, <clears throat> which resembled like the New York Underground. I think the New York Underground was too racy for junior high school. So um, um, he was showing us things that were for school, but they, but they were people that were, that were painting on film, experimental cinema. He showed us a film called Very Nice, Very Nice, which you can see online. Um, which is kind of was amazing to us, and then he showed Citizen Kane, which is the one that always gets them. You know, like gets the kids. <laughs> like um, everyone always cites the Citizen Kane as their first, you know, influence, and it was for me as well. Um, at the same time as he showed <clears throat> Citizen Kane in in class in 16 millimeter, um, it was also scheduled in a, on a low-budget um, New York City um, TV station, uh, Channel 9. And they, they, they were low-budget enough that whatever film that they would show, they would show it every day three different times. So if you wanted to watch Citizen Kane more than once, you, know, you, could, just, you could watch it ten times. And I think I watched it many times. And I realized, uh, you know, at, as a 14-year-old, that there was um, psychology involved in in cinema. It wasn't just escape. It wasn't just entertainment. But there was other things. Um, because I think probably the reason that he, it influenced so many other filmmakers as well. That it's very um, it's simple. It's it's um, simple enough for a 14 year old to understand. But it really got me interested in more like traditional um, movie theater cinema at the same time as he was showing us this, the uh, experimental works. In my art class, I had a, an art teacher, 1961. He was a gay man. He was an out gay man in 1961 in a very com uh, um, conservative community um, in Connecticut. And he was jealous that the... Uh, the English professor was showing us art films. He was showing us the, the Canadian Film Board films, and he said, those are, those are art films. They're not really English films. Um, but there was these two influences at the same time when I was young. Later, I, I um, um, got a summer job two years later and saved my money up for uh, a 8 millimeter camera, and I started to make... Um, experimental films because I, I was painting as well because of the influence of the art teacher but uh, the um, the thing that was going on in sort of my area in New York City was the, the, uh, a lot of painters like Stan Brackage or uh, Ron Rice or um, other experimental filmmakers Warhol they were starting to make films so it's something that a film a painter did so I thought I had sort of a, a direction as far as an experimental um, cinema. I didn't really think about dramatic cinema at the time until later. So those are the earliest. Cool, because also the first time that I saw Rockstar Cowboy, the dream scenes reminds me of some paintings from from Magritte or Dali. Even in the video clip San Francisco Days, which I recommend a lot, uh, I saw Magritte in, in that in that scenes. And at the moment, which are your main influences in art or, or 
Magritte in the in some of the films or yeah yeah a uh, shot that looked like Magritte in 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 the drugstore cowboy in the in the dream in the dream scene sequences I find something like like Magritte, like Magritte. I think Magritte I mean any the surrealists were very influential uh, also to like I think a young person it was so playful and unexpected and outrageous that for young people and also it was it was the countercultural revolution. <laughs> so all these things were happening in the 60s that the surrealists were, um, you know, ha interesting. So there is an influence. I don't know if... Uh, the, thing, the thing that usually I liked about Magritte was the, the sort of light sky and the dark, you know, cityscape. Cool. So, uh, well, can we talk a little bit about Mala Noche? Mala Noche is a short film based on Walter Cortis' novel. And I think it's vital on this moment because, of, because it's an important reflection about the communication problem, and especially between Mexico and USA. You know, we are so close in a way, but also we are far away in, in another way. So I think it's it, your, your short film and, and one that the, f the first one that, that became uh, kind of uh, recognized uh, worldwide. Uh, what what do you want to trust me? Do you want to, do you want to express? And what did you pick this this novel or or uh, from from Cortis? Um, let's see. I I had been living in Hollywood. Um, I moved there after uh, college, where I where I majored in film. I moved to Hollywood. Um, worked for a comedian named Ken Shapiro. He. Um, he was working on a new film. Uh, his, his original film was called The Groove Tube, which at the time, uh, it, was, it was skits. It was like comedic, comedic, comedic uh, interludes. And um, he was writing his next piece, which was called uh, Ma Bell, which was about uh, phone freaks, people that, that uh, used the phones for like... Um, you know, for, free distance for calls. fun, basically. Mm -hmm. Early, early tech guys, basically. Okay. Um, and so he was writing. His writer was Lauren Michaels, who, who basically, with the idea of Ken's early film, The Groove Tube, he sort of took that idea and pitched it as Saturday Night Live. Okay. And um, Lauren had left, and he was like telling Ken, "Come to New York. We're going to do this TV show." And uh, Ken had sort of grown up in New York, so he didn't want to go. So this became like the longest running TV show in the America. So um, Ken was very bitter that his, his movie was so successful as a TV show. Um, and he didn't really have a connection to it. You know, Lauren had just sort of like used the, the format. Um, so I did that in Hollywood. Uh, I made a film right after that uh, called Alice in Hollywood which was a 16 millimeter feature that wasn't so good. I didn't get into any film festivals. It was very sort of a tragedy that, you know, the, the, um, the end result wasn't as captivating as I hoped. Um, so I, uh, I had moved to New York and saved up money to make uh, this next film, Malanoche, which was set in Portland. Meanwhile, I, was, uh, I had gone to high school in Portland um, after the school in Connecticut, and um, uh, and I frequently went back there to uh, visit, and I had actually worked in 1977 on a film called Property by Penny Allen about a group of uh, hippies that try and buy the house, the houses that they live in, the houses that they pay rent. They try and go to the bank and buy the houses so they aren't exploited. As, as people that needed to pay rent. And um, so it was kind of this uh, socialist comment uh, in the art community of Portland. And Walt Curtis was the lead character. And Walt Curtis had written Malanoche. He was the author. And Penny um, gave me the book. It was a very small book um, about his experiences a couple of years earlier working in a grocery store and meeting two migrant boys who were living in the old part of Portland and 
working in, um, in the uh, fields outside of Portland for, uh, you know, uh, vegetable companies, picking vegetables. And um, they would live in the, in the city, and then they would, they would go out on, uh, on buses out to the fields to work. And in the winter, there was no work, so some of the workers just stayed in town so they didn't have to go across the border, which was dangerous. And uh, they, um, they had nothing to do, so they got in trouble. They were young. They were, uh, say, 18 and 20 or maybe younger, and they, um, they just were getting in trouble. They were pulling pranks, and Walt was in the same community uh, working in a uh, sandwich shop in a grocery store. So they would visit him, and he would give them the sandwiches because they had no money. And it was about uh, their relationship. He, 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 he fell in love with Johnny, one of the boys, and was writing this book about this kind of a death in Venice obsession over the beauty of, of uh, Juan Cito and uh, um, this sort of tragedy, this sort of like um, thing that you might read in a novel but I'd never really seen in cinema. So I thought um, after the experience of Alice in Hollywood, it would be, it was, it was something that um, I thought was challenging as, as a story for basically an audience. Um, with all these different, uh, this gay relationship and the and the migrant, the migrant workers and the old town in Portland, uh, so I um, squandered my um, my money that I made in New York on on this this film, and uh, I mean these these are years are going by, you know, like two years to save up the money, a year to cast Malanoche just to find people that looked correct for the parts. Nobody wanted to be in it. It was a gay relationship. Mm -hmm. the, the, the people that we found that were actual workers in the Portland area were very uh, excited, but then they never were going to really do it because it was too, it was too um, I think, um, sexually like provocative. Okay. It wasn't the cinema that they ever had seen. They also made quite a bit of money in the fields compared to what we could pay them as actors. So it took a year to cast these two characters, and um, then another year to edit, and it was just on and on and on. Cool. And the music always plays a role. That's super important in your films, and, and, and I can imagine in your life. You have worked with David Bowie, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Elton John, Chris Isaac, Delight, Stone Temple Pilots, just, just to mention a few ones. Can you share us... Can you share with us how is the process to bring a song into a different form of art? Um, the first video I did was for David Bowie. It was, um, I hadn't, uh, or maybe I made one for Victoria Williams, which was a low budget piece. And then I got this offer to make a video from uh, a reissue of Fame, mm -hmm. which was, uh, a project that David Bowie was working on. And so, because it was David Bowie, I just couldn't say no. I couldn't, you know, <laughs> pass it up. I thought, this is crazy that, that I was being asked in the first place. And it was because we had released Drug, uh, Drugstore Cowboy, and uh, um, it was quite popular in, you know, uh, certain artistic circles, and Bowie was a fan of it. So, um, we made this um, this video for, for fame, which was okay. It didn't turn out really the way that I had planned. Um, it, was, um, it was sort of a practice, I think, uh, right at that time, MTV was new, and a lot of filmmakers were, were starting to um, make videos, and there were whole sort of little industries um, um, springing up that were making videos for uh, bands, and that, and that they, as a way to like sell their records, you know, like the MTV became very popular, which I think we had doubts when it first went on the air. I think all the filmmakers were sort of laughing at it, mm -hmm. and then it became very, very successful and also necessary for your release of uh, your album. So um, 
I thought that um, I started to get a few more off offers. I was, uh, I found a, like a video sort of contact, an agent, and, and was making different things. I, I had cast Flea in, I wanted to cast Flea in um, Drugstore Cowboy, and he didn't make the cut. It was like um, sort of a group decision. I think that he was one of my favorites, but um, he says he's never seen Drugstore Cowboy because he didn't, he didn't get cast in it. But um, I knew them, and I cast him in, Mal in my own private Idaho. Um, and so we got to be friends, and so he, he had asked me to, sh uh, to shoot a video for Under the Bridge, which um, that album, and particularly that song, had become sort of their breakthrough moment in rock and roll because they were sort of a punk band and a very kind of underground band, a Hollywood band, um, that um, were very risky. You know, they, did, they would, they would uh, play naked on stage. They did all kinds of strange publicity. And this was their all of a sudden um, kind of um, mainstream radio hit. And after Under the Bridge, they became like more of a college rock band. Not that they wanted to be that, but they, you know, they sort of found this sort of amazing success, which continues today. Uh, so we yeah, um, made that for them. To, the process of like, you know, having a song influence your, um, you know, interpretation of their music in, in cinema is... Um, you know, I, I don't know if I could describe it, just think things up and, you know. Um, they usually, in my case, didn't make, they were visual, they weren't make, trying to make sense, they weren't trying to be stories or anything like that, they were visual pieces. I, I had done, uh, let's see, I think I may have, I think with the Chili Peppers it was a, a sort of thing that I, a, a technique where I was using multiple images and combining them and using um, almost like a collage. And on a, a video um, sort of um, set up in a TV station, you could, you could block out sections of the screen and put other images into them. So you could make this live-like um, collage of images, which, it, which I think was, was something that I first did in um, Under the Bridge. But later I, I did a little videos for... Um, William Burroughs and Allen Ginsberg. It was the same kind of like um, um, multiple image uh, uh, technique. Okay. Um, getting back a little bit on cinema. Uh, also, as a screenwriter, I would love to know more about your adaptation process from a novel into a script. For example, Drugstore Cowboy comes also from the novel by James Fogel. How did you translate it into a film? How was the idea? I, I, I had read that the novel is amazing. It's his only novel from, from, from Fogel, who was at Yale at the time for, for, for the things that he has done as a, as, a, as a junkie and as a thief. But he's quite a, a, a character, right? Yeah, I mean, the technique was... I mean, the techniques usually um, tend to be nuts and bolts and pretty boring. Uh, the book was a very um, kind of classically pulp fiction piece of work that uh, um, had been, you know, sort of a style of fiction for a long time. These sort of underground stories about criminals and um, Jim Thompson style novel that I think um, was, was something that uh, somebody that was in prison might actually spend their, their time doing about writing stories about their own adventures as people living on the outside of their prison life um, and um, trying to kind of cut corners legally. <laughs> In this case, they, they were actually um, um, a group of friends who were, ident they identified as thieves. They didn't identify as junkies or, um, you know, they weren't murderers. They just stole things and, and sold them. So they were originally... Um, Fogel had spent his life uh, um, going, going in and out of prison since he was 
I think, 13. He, um, he came from Washington State. And it was like in the 50s, I think, you, you know, you could end up in prison at, at a younger age than maybe you could now. Um, I don't think he was going to the mainstream prison at 13, but he, um, he had many stories. He had, he had uh, four different novels. And they came to me by way of a, of a filmmaking friend who was in a writing program with uh, the author of The Birdman of Alcatraz. And the program uh, was created by him. Um, the author of Birdman of Alcatraz had um, um, a little um, sort of uh, school where he, he would give lessons to people trying to write outside of prison, but he would also um, have uh, shops inside. And he would connect the people inside prison with the people outside to help the prisoners send their manuscripts around to publishers to get them published because it was hard for them to mail their works out through the prison. Um, so uh, Dan had been hooked up with James Fogel and he had a collection of his novels and he was trying to get them published but he was also trying to get them uh, seen by people in Hollywood um, and Dan wanted to write the script and he, he had written one of the scripts and, uh, and was showing it to different filmmakers in LA when I, when I met him and he gave me Drugstore Cowboy and he gave me another one called Satan's Sandbox mm -hmm. which was about something in, inside prison um, and it, it, I adapted both of those into screenplays very quickly. I was, I was at that time, um, through Malanoche, I had found an agent in Hollywood, which was sort of a, um, something I had been avoiding because I thought agents were um, bad. Be just because of the, you know, the Hollywood system. I was very outside the Hollywood system. I thought agents were something that you could, sub you could step around. I didn't realize the control they had. So I, ha I had this agent, which I wasn't really paying too much attention to, but he was sending me around to, to studios to meet um, executives and show them screenplays that I was writing. And I showed them the manuscripts first, and then I realized I needed a screenplay. And I wrote both of those into screenplays. And um, right about then, Malanoche in the LA Gay Film Festival had won um, a uh, LA Film Critics Prize, a prize that the film critics gave to sort of like the, um, the sort of outsider independent artists. They gave prizes to like best actor, was Jack Nicholson. Uh, Bertolucci won for like best director um, for his film. Um, I can't remember the film that year, but um, they were very, uh, you know, the, the LA time, or the LA Film Critics Awards. And then they gave like a sort of guest's prize to one of their favorite people just to help them, basically. So I had won that one. It was called um, The Best Experimental uh, um, Dramatic Film Maker. And so if you just left off the experimental, you were the best dramatic filmmaker. <laughs> and so we left off the experimental. And um, the agents... I was living in Portland, Oregon at this time, and uh, I also had sort of contempt for uh, award ceremonies and, you know, prizes and so forth. So I thought, well, maybe I'll send my friend to pick up the award, and I'll just stay in Oregon. And I called my agent and said, did you know that I won this award? And he's like, are you kidding? Yes, of course I know. We're sending copies of Malanoche to, like, everyone we know, and we're sending scripts of Drugstore Cowboy. And I said, oh, do you think I should come down? And he's like, of course you should come down. This is, this is very, very important. So I went down, and, um, and on, on that trip, I found my agent. And he, um, um, or I guess I, I found the agent first somehow. And then, uh, uh, oh, yeah, because we had already shown it. The award ceremony was later. So they were sending it out to everyone they knew, and somebody, uh, Avenue Pictures, decided to do it. And um, what was the question, though? <laughs> well, about the, the process of adaptation from the novel. The adaptation, to, right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, this Thanks. is how the adaptation worked. Um, I mean, it was, a, it was a typical manuscript. It was typewritten. It was, um, um, I took parts of the book. I marked off the ones that I didn't, pieces that I didn't want. I tried to make it smaller. I, I literally, like, sort of transposed the writing into screenplay. Like, I was being very true to James Fogel's original concept um, and story and style and humor. All the stuff that you see in that film is really Fogel's work. Um, and it really was, like, redacting part, you know, cutting it out. Uh, there were Xerox machines. There were no computers at the time. And just retyping it. Um, things that... We learned things about the, um, the group of bandits, um, the Fogel and his friends. Through, through Fogel, we were writing him in prison. And the friends, they were also in prison. And there were more, way more stories about the group and adventures... So there was more material than we could really handle. Um, and we um, visited the sister of James Fogel, and she had pictures of them. So they were like, art, the art department could see the pictures and the costumes, the outfits that they were wearing, um, which were very odd, like in the film. Um, we were basically, I mean, I, I and also the crew and Matt Dillon, everybody was trying to be very true to the original source you know, in an effort to make something that was truly, like, a uh, film noir or pulp fiction. I can imagine that the prize that you earned in the L.A. Film Festival helped you to obtain the names that you wanted for Drugstore Cowboy. I mean, Matt Dillon at that moment was on the top, but in, probably in another genders. Yeah, Matt, Matt was introduced to me through my, my agency. Once, once you're in, William Morris was the agency. Once you're there... Um, you know, the agents are kind of like filtering all their projects around. And Matt, in particular, was interested in working with younger, uh, coming, uh, you know, coming up filmmakers. Um, and so I think he saw Malanoche and it was like, this guy, I want to work with this guy. So he, he was very high on it. But the production company that was um, um, producing it, they had higher ideas. They had just made Kiss of the Spider Woman, uh, which was very successful, and William Hurt had won an Oscar. So they had this, you know, this style, and so we started at Jack Nicholson. Um, okay. And I went and, and got the script to Tom Waits, and Tom Waits wanted to do it. Okay. And so my first meeting with uh, Avenue Pictures, I mentioned that we had Tom Waits and they were sort of not very impressed. He was in another film that they were making. So I had to call Tom Waits and say, sorry, man. Like, Ouch. <laughs> he says, oh, they're not buying my act, huh? They went, and I said, well, I guess, you know, like, and, uh, and next in, in line, I think Sean Penn was there, Matthew Modine. And these are people that passed. And then we sort of, like, pushed Matt into it. Matt was a lot younger than the, the original character was around 40 years old. Matt was 26. And um, he, um, he got the part. And the rest is history. Uh, also following these this narrative questions, you credited Shakespeare's Henry Ford in my own private Idaho. Do you want to talk about this unique and modern interpretation of Shakespeare? For, yeah. For, yeah, for my yeah. own private Idaho. I had, um, let's see, I had, I think I, I had seen Chimes at Midnight, which was an Orson Welles film, mm -hmm. which was an adaptation of different Falstaffian segments of Shakespearean plays and sort of put together. And the way that, um, that he made it sort of reminded me of kind of the... Um, and sometimes the artistic community or just the, the sort of bohemian community in Portland, Oregon. The sort of underground characters like Falstaff, the, um, the um, you know, sort of they become robbers in, in, uh, in Prince, uh, Prince Hal and his sidekick, Pistol. They become, you know, robbers with, with Falstaff. And they resemble people in modern day. I think the way... Wells was handling it partly. Um, 
So I, um, when I first had my William Morris agent, one of the scripts, along with Drugstore Cowboy, was a script where I was, I was also um, using Shakespeare to tell a story about um, Portland characters. And the script was completely Shakespearean, the, one that I, the first one that I had, which had, um, I can't remember the title right now, but um, um, I think Minions of the Moon. I think that was a line in, the, uh, in Shakespeare. And uh, people would read it. The, the executives that I was meeting were, were very like middle executives, so nobody could really like make the movie, but I was meeting a lot of people. And so I had that sort of in my, on my shelf. After I made Drugstore Cowboy, there was that script. There was a few other scripts about um, these uh, male street prostitutes in Portland that um, were, one was called In a Blue Funk. One, that one was about uh, the Mike character and a German auto par parts salesman. Um, then there was the Shakespeare, and then there was a short story that I wrote that was called Ma uh, My Own Private Idaho, which was, which was Ray Manji from uh, Malanoche and his young uh, nephew named George Jorge, who was, uh, who was, I think, 10 years old, who was kind of this uh, Angelo, Angelo, my love, is that a uh, character? Who, even though he was 10, he was trying to pick up girls who were like 25 on the street. He was very like full of himself. And um, so it was, a, it was a script about, or a short story intended to be a film about them. And so after Drugstore Cowboy, I, I just put them all together into one piece. And kind of like, while um, the editor was arduously working on Drugstore Cowboy and my mornings were off, I would be writing uh, my own private Idaho as the next piece. And it's, the title of the film comes from the song from the B-52s, even that in the, in the film doesn't... It doesn't, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that, that came from uh, my visits to Idaho. There was a group of friends that lived in, in um, Sun Valley, Idaho. And they would, because they lived in Idaho, and the B-52s record had just come out at that time in the... Uh, 70s, they, they would sing that song all the time. So I think that it was partly um, that I had been, been to Idaho and that it was uh, uh, sort of dreamy as a, as a story and that um, and there was this title, which was a great title. Um, so it was uh, borrowed from, from the B-52s. And it doesn't... It does sort of have... Uh, I mean, he does go on a journey into um, to Idaho. So aside from that, it doesn't really have too much of a connection. And because Idaho, I think, is the perfect film. I love it. It's, it's amazing the way it shows the reality of these characters. And I think that because of the freedom, the themes and characters that you portrayed it in Idaho, it jumped into our society like a clean and pure oxygen. How do you think this film changed the film industry and especially the indie world? Um, well, the screenplay, like, I think that up until then, the things that I had worked on were pretty traditional. They were trying to tell a story in a way that resembled movies that I had seen before. And I was kind of, um, in, in some ways, playing a game that I imagined existed, which I don't think really exists, you know, of um, cinema as it was in the U.S. And, and also the rest of the world at that time in um, 1989 or uh, the years that I was writing it. And um, I think Idaho uh, attracted enough attention that I sort of was uh, confident to, to kind of do whatever I wanted, sort of it free, freed me up so that I could, you know, as also just um, a, an experiment, personal experiment, to see what would happen if I just 
did exactly what I wanted to do, as opposed to let um, kind of the the template of, say, the screenplay or the template of the modern movie influence me. And a lot of filmmakers, I think, had been doing this already. I mean, Herzog, in particular, was very influential, and uh, we looked at Herzog's films in making uh, uh, My Own Private Idaho. We were watching Heart of Glass, and we were watching uh, Strosek. Those two films, I showed the, the, the cast and the crew as, you know, like, so this is the kind of film we're making. So there was a connection to other cinema. It wasn't completely freed of influences. But through Herzog, I think um, there was more, like, kind of validation of, like, you can do this. You, you know, and he was already breaking, like, every rule um, and making beautiful films. So um, there were other influences, I think. Samuel Beckett was a, a big influence. Um, so I, I think that when I was writing it, I was literally um, just following my own instincts that I could come up with without sort of using uh, like uh, cinema rules. And, and uh, you know, I was very concerned, although I, it was an experiment and experiments are concerning. Um, so I just forged ahead and made the screenplay, which was very strange. It was 70 pages long. It was written um, in different typefaces. By then, Apple had, had made a computer, and Steve Jobs had put all the different typefaces that you could choose, like 20 different typefaces. So it was written in different typefaces um, and different sizes of type throughout and different punctuation as well. And sometimes the, the letters flo floated in a sort of E.E. E. Cummings style, uh, poetry style. Um, through the page, and I remember giving it to executives at, say, there was an executive at Universal that I, that wanted to see it, and so I gave it to him, and he said I liked it, but we could never do this. And partly, I think, in the world of of Hollywood, partly you needed to make a screenplay that was exactly 118 pages long, and exactly like, you know, 12 point or uh, or 10 point type that was courier type and if you if you even today you need to do this um, if you varied it just sent off you know red flags so you might not get your film going if you didn't follow those particular rules I mean Hollywood's interested in controlling the project so it's an indication that you may not be controllable if you vary from from just the typeface of your screenplay which is silly um, so none of those guys did it. Um, we, we sort of were helped along. It was a lot of people were sort of standoffish about that screenplay. And it was really casting uh, River and Keanu that helped get it going at New Line. And they were really sort of excited about the actors um, more than maybe the screenplay. So um, we got that going. And again, I forgot the question. But <laughs> no, but also many, many critics have compared uh, Idaho with the misfits, also because of the power and the energy that has, and and also the 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 cast that you crafted, and also it changes the shape of the industry because you can talk a lot about the teams that you wanted with freedom, and and talk about these misfits and transform them into a commercial success because I can imagine that the Idaho was was releasing every place in the world, distributed in, in, in the States with, with a lot of success, and, and also was in Venice, was in a lot of festivals. What, what happens after that kind of success? I mean, you have to stop a little bit and then to think what... what I mean, I was I, still very unaware of like what sort of performance or, or like... Um, you know, um, support I get from, like, its release internationally, I I'm surprised, usually. Like, when I come here, I'm surprised that, you know, some of you know that mo movie. It's like, um, I know that it, 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 in the States it did quite well, but you, it's very invisible to me, like, w what it does in each country, unless I go to the country. 
Um, but even then, it's hard culturally to, to really know um, how, how that works. You know? So I wasn't really, aw still not really aware of it, and also not really aware of its influence um, and what, how it influenced other filmmakers. Well, its, it's influence is huge, and here in Mexico, it's a classic, and Great. everybody loves it. Uh, talking about to die for, it's prophetic in the way that anyone can do for a like or for a thousand likes. It's a very sharp film. The cast that you crafted is astonishing. How was the process to deal with a great script, a super cast, big studios, and your commitment as an artist? What was the, the thousand what? Likes. It's like uh, in like. Nicole Kidman wants to be on TV. She, she wants to oh, yeah. be a celebrity. So now I think that everybody wants to, that, that their photos mm -hmm. becomes a huge success with likes and that their oh, Instagram yeah. story becomes... Yeah, it was an early period of what we have yeah. on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, well, it was, it, was, it was the period that, let's see, um, it was the Pamela Smart case uh, that was, um, she lived in New Hampshire. She had a radio show, the original mm -hmm. story. And um, she taught the kids that were in high school, she taught them about having a radio show. And meanwhile, she, had, she convinced one of them to kill her husband because she was, I think the husband wanted, um, I'm not, it wasn't the same vanity thing. I don't think that, that there was this thing about afraid to have children because she would look Probably. different. Yeah. I think, which in, in the film we have, but um, uh, she convinced her student uh, to um, kill her husband, which he did. And it became, at the, right at the same time, um, there was cable news, which was new. Cable was new. And the way that uh, these... Um, these channels were constructed. Um, there were so many of them internationally that all of a sudden, this small town, Durham, North, uh, New, Ham or, I forgot the, I forgot the town, New Hampshire. Everyone from around the world, with their, with their ca cameras, like descended, and it became um, an international um, uh, crime story. And there were people like uh, Larry Clark went to the trial, um, and he photographed the, uh, the people in the trial. I guess, I don't know how he did that, but those pictures appear in some of his books. Um, those were around. That book was printed. Joyce Maynard had, um, had been a columnist, and um, she, um, this was her first novel, and she lived in the town, so she wrote about um, her fictional version of the... Um, Pamela Smart story, and uh, it became to die for, and so um, it was really a comment on the new, the new media, which was very new at the time. It just didn't exist before. It exists now, um, but it was the first time. So we were we were super fascinated by, like, what that meant. We didn't know what it meant, but it was it seemed crazy that um, that it was so uh, all pervasive internationally and also through the States. And Buck Henry had been asked to be the screenwriter, and we had the same agent, and the, the producer you know, um, wanted me to direct and Buck to write. This was her like, dream. Buck had written um, The Graduate and other things. And he was, a, he was a very funny writer, and also very um, sort of um, precise and um, investigative and um, you know, a lot of things. So I remember um, um, him adapting it. And I remember calling him on the phone one day, and he couldn't talk because he said he was watching perhaps the most interesting thing he'd ever seen, you know, that year. And it was on TV. It was Charles Manson defending himself in court. So you see, they would, they would air things like that. They don't do this anymore. They would air Marlon Brando in court or Woody Allen in court. It would be, you could watch the whole court case. The Menendez brothers were on TV. Um, OJ 
was on TV at this time, and it was, it was out of control, basically. And uh, so there was this atmosphere of this new media that kind of was inspiring the whole project. Uh, and was, you know, we just, we loved it and hated it and all at the same time. Um, I, I think the, the studio was very, very, like, uh, the producer was a, was a very pushy producer, Laura Ziskin. She um, got Amy Pascal, who's at Sony, interested in it. And we made a very low-budget film within the, the world of Sony. We, we, Sony only put, like, $7 million into the project and rank film in England that represented the rest of the world, or, or at least half the world, um, they, um, they put in $7 million. So it was a $14 million film, which was, I think at the time, films were maybe, they were a little more. They were maybe 25, 30, 35. And when we were done with the movie, it tested very, very poorly. Right. Like, the worst, I think, the worst te one of the worst tests I've ever had. Um, and um, we were encouraged to keep editing. So we were editing for like a year. And finally, the tests didn't change. <laughs> they were always testing like 33, which is quite low. Um, and so we, we were um, basically finishing it and kind of giving up ourselves, thinking that the movie was sort of a wash. And uh, the studio did as well. And then Rank Film, on its own, had sent it to Cannes Film Festival. And so we all went to Cannes. And at Cannes, the New York Times wrote something really good about it. And all of a sudden, it changed from like this loser film to like something that Sony wanted to actually push. And it became a pretty successful film. And they actually did a regular release. It was kind of scheduled for like the shelf, actually. And then it was saved by this review. And um, so it wasn't a very happy, like, studio situation. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like we were on top of the world mm -hmm. at a studio. We were very um, underground in the, our own studio. Uh, after, after To Die For, you received it an, an script, uh, Good Will Haunting, from two young writers, Matt Damon and Ben Affleck, who at the moment were still nobody. And you made a huge film. How was, how, how was the experience with Good Will Hunting? Uh, it was great. It was a great experience. Um, that film, I mean, I, I seem to, the, the films always seem to have sort of a similar um, um, life. You know, they were always Drugstore Cowboy, um, To Die For, My Own Private Idaho were all films that um, um, kind of looked, looked down on in, within the companies that they were made. They were always sort of the, the black sheep. Mm -hmm. Drugstore Cowboy was kind of the least, you know, within the, the, the powers above you, the executives. It was looked down upon as an experiment for them. Like, probably won't make any money. Uh, but all the films were always like that. Um, Goodwill Hunting also had this stigma because of uh, Ben Affleck and Matt Damon were, were contractually um, uh, guaranteed to be the lead characters. Mm -hmm. And they weren't, they, they were dust, you know, they were uh, immovable because they knew that, that if they weren't the lead characters, they would like uh, become writers perhaps, but they, they, they wanted to be actors. And they wanted, they wanted to do the Sylvester Stallone thing and cast, cast themselves in, in their own screenplay. And because of that, um, even though uh, um, the company that ended up making it, Miramax, um, had a high hopes of casting um, Brad Pitt and Leo DiCaprio, okay. um, who had both re read the script. It's a long time ago, but um, they, were, they had read it, apparently, according to Harvey Weinstein, who's in prison. Um, <laughs> um, it's a whole other story. Um, but <laughs> he was, you know, kind of arguing with, I guess, Matt. I'm not sure. If ben was maybe busy, but Matt would tell us these arguments that they would have, and he was, he was going to pay them, like, 
a million dollars to just walk away from the acting roles. And he just said, no, we're not doing it. We're, we're in the film. And so the, the film became less and less desire, desirable to Harvey. I had, I had read the script pretty early on when Miramax first bought it. They bought it from Castle Rock. It was a film which at Castle Rock, which was um, Rob Reiner's film, I mean, Rob Reiner's company, he was one of the five executives at Castle Rock. Rob Reiner had, had developed the film Good Will Hunting with Ben Affleck and, and Matt Damon, and he had convinced them to cut out the, um, the action sequences. Okay. Like, Will Hunting is a genius, and the FBI and the NSA and the CIA, they all want him. Okay. And they follow him in, in black limousines when he goes from his job to home to South Boston, and he, he often plays cat and mouse and like runs away from them. And so there are action sequences in the original script. And so Rob was, was according to Rob, he was like, you guys, you don't, need, you don't need these action sequences. The film works as a, you know, a, a drama. It doesn't need action mixed in. He said, why do you have the action in, in the um, screenplay? And Matt and Ben said, well, to break into, the, into Hollywood. And he said, well, you're in Hollywood. This, we're Hollywood. We are Hollywood. So you're here. You don't need, we bought it. We bought the screenplay. So he convinced them to take that part out. So by the time uh, Harvey bought it, Harvey bought it from uh, um, Castle Rock because Castle Rock had assigned a director that Matt and Ben didn't like. He was an executive. Okay. He wasn't a filmmaker. And they said, we don't want this, this guy to be the director. And they made, Castle Rock made a deal. If you can get somebody to buy it from us within 30 days which is a very short time um, to get people to read it and come up with, there was a million dollar price tag on it, which was huge for like an untried screenplay and, and they were the leads. And Kevin Smith, Ben was in a Kev, Kevin Smith movie, um, the one where they're angels, like Ben and Matt are both angels. Yeah, oh no, he was in Mallrats, Mallrats, yeah. not the angel, not Dogma. Mm -hmm. was, ben was acting in Mallrats and it was like their last day before the 30 days were up. And he said, Kevin, we have to sell our screenplay. And Kevin called Harvey. And Harvey, just on Kevin's recommendation, bought it. You know, which was fortunate for me. Um, and, uh, and he was shopping it to um, uh, Robert Redford to direct and also play Sean, okay. um, which was Robin's character. Um, and uh, Robert Redford said no. Then he went to Mel Gibson to direct and play Sean, and he said no. And it kept going that way until finally it was hitting like commercial direct. I said yes, mm -hmm. but I wanted final cut, and Harvey said no. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it kept going until finally um, the summer rolled around. It was like a whole you know, season went by, a couple seasons went by, and uh, Matt was cast by Francis Coppola in The Rainmaker, which was a John Grisham story. And uh, Harvey realized, oh, if Matt's in Good Will Hunting, we have the John Grisham kid, which he called him the John Grisham kid. Um, he says, he says uh, get it. He's called Lawrence Bender, who produced Pulp Fiction. It was like one of his right-hand men. He's like, Lawrence, get this in production. This will come out after the after the Rainmaker, we'll have the John Grisham kid in our movie. We'll make a, a bunch of money. So that was the idea. He, Harvey claims this isn't true, but um, I was there. And um, <laughs> so um, we went to Nashville where they were shooting the Rainmaker to work on the script, and we just were flying into production all of a sudden. I happened to be friends with somebody that was friends with Lawrence. So Lawrence knew I wanted to do it, and he hired me like in a minute. He was like, okay, you're hired. So we all flew there and um, started working on it and shot it that winter. And uh, what was the question? <laughs> well, how, how was your experience? But now this, this is uh, this is great to, to shooting. Hear. It? Yeah, well, if shooting and 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 working in in with with this script that. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. one of the questions is like the there wasn't really a lot of hope with the movie and any more hope than there was with To Die For or 
My Own, Pri My, My Own Private Idaho or Drugstore Cowboy. These are all movies that, you know, we hoped even play, you know, got into theaters. Uh, we, I think they were all kind of unknown enough that um, we didn't really know what their fate would be. We, of course, hoped that they would win the Academy Award, but, you know, all filmmakers do, I think. Um, so same with Good Will Hunting. We were just hoping to, to like, not mess it up, you know, and try, try and make something good. Um, Rob and I had worked a little bit with on, uh, um, on Harvey Milk, which was a, the mayor of Castro Street, and Robin was going to play Harvey Milk, and um, it was a hand-me-down from Oliver Stone, who had, who had decided not to shoot the mayor of Castro Street. So Robin was still the actor, and I was the replacement. And I, you know, basically I had problems with the script, and I was dragging my feet, and all of a sudden I was fired, and they, you know, they went on their way, and eventually I came around and made it later, but um, um, Robin was somebody I, I knew, and he was on our list. I think Harvey was, was checking again with, like, who's going to play Sean, and, and that, that character was going to be our box office, because Matt and Ben, I mean, we had the John Grisham kid, but um, Matt and Ben were, uh, um, you know, not big names. So Robin, Robin was our one big name, or whoever played that part. So Robin, because he knew me, partly, um, and I think he, he liked my work also, that, which he allowed me to play, you know, take over for Oliver Stone. Um, and he, he liked the script. He thought, he thought the whole thing was, was kind of great. And we also limited it to, he got a lot of money compared to everybody else. And uh, he, we limited his shoot to like three weeks. We like did it all at the same time. And um, um, it wasn't anything that any of us expected would really break out. Um, when we showed it to the press, I think one of the re reactions was um, a, a, a person who was in charge of booking the Dave, Dave, David Letterman show she saw the movie, and they wanted Matt to go on the David Letterman show, and she just thought he couldn't carry a movie. She thought he was a bad actor. And so this was the first notice we got from the press. They would show the press. One of the typical things is to show press to see sort of what they might write about the movie and kind of react to it. And that was one of the first reactions, so I was going, okay, well, maybe she's right. You know, like, who knows? It works for me, but um, I always thought Matt was like, Unbelievable, you know. Like he, we actually tried to cast him in To Die For, which is where I met him was earlier on. And um, so the, the hope was like sort of limited until um, we tested it, and it tested very, very, very high in the 90s. So all of a sudden, um, you know, uh, after the test that night um, in New Jersey at the testing theater, uh, John Gordon, our producer, called Harvey, who was in England. He said, Harvey, the, the movie scored 92. And he went, oi. <laughs> and he says, call me later, because it was midnight, it was late there. And uh, so he was happy to hear the test score. But like, and all of a sudden, you know, he put his weight behind it and really pushed it. You know, and when, he did, when Harvey did that, it was good, because he would spend money. And that was another part. It was like Har Harvey pushing it for the Oscars and Harvey pushing it for the theaters as well. So... Um, it just worked out. Uh, Elephant, Pan, Pan, Pandor at Khan is your own script. And it's a great film, it's a masterpiece. And how was your experience to deal with death and violence in America? And were you prepared to, to what happened with that film? Which film? Elephant. Oh, Elephant. Um, was I prepared for... What's up? Was I prepared for what? For, for, for what happened with that film, with, with, that? As, a, with, with as a statement, no, violence, another, and, and... No, that was and another um, surprise. I mean, uh, Elephant was following... Um, um, Elephant has a funny story. Um, we had made Jerry in the desert with Matt Damon and Casey Affleck, and I, in the making of that story, um, we were... I think for the first time I was working... Um, on a movie that had no, no scripts. We were going to like make it up. 
according to like what we felt should happen. We would shoot the first scene first and then the second scene and keep going that way. We did have a, have a story that we had read in the newspapers about these two boys who get lost in the desert. So we had that as a guide. One killed the other one and only one guy was left and he, he went to court. Um, and they never really could figure out what happened, you know. I mean, he, he became delusional, he said. He was delirious. He thought his friend was a, a monster and like he had a pen knife and killed him. Um, so that, um, in the ensuing, like, uh, kind of attempt to, like, work with no script and being in the desert and so forth, um, I thought I was going to make, like, a John Cassavetes movie, but I had recently seen Bela Tarr's Satan Tango and uh, thought it was amazing. And I realized that that um, cinematic, like, style was something that really would apply to what we were up to in the desert because uh, both, both um, Casey and Matt were becoming less and less forthcoming as kind of um, improvisers in front of the camera. They had, they had something holding them back. So it started to become this different movie from what I thought we were making in the beginning. And I was applying this like style that I'd seen in Bela's movies to this project with no screenplay. And uh, when I got finished with it, we had been simultaneously, I was working on Elephant, um, which was um, a project that was inspired by Columbine, was a, was a reaction to Columbine. It was a way, I thought that in, in, the, in the world of the Columbine massacre and, and the press, um, it sort of followed um, something that, ha that happened in To Die For, something that happened when Kurt Cobain killed himself, is the press sort of became obsessed with the story. And, um, and it was a big, you know, tragedy. And it appeared, like, on every newspaper, every magazine, every radio show, every documentary. And there was no, you know, inclusion from, uh, you know... Uh, Dramatists. Dramatists weren't allowed to kind of peek into the world of Columbine because they were, dramatists made entertainment and it was bad taste to investigate dramatically, you know, the, the reason, why, you know, what happened. What, like, why did these two guys, you know, attack their own school? The reason was always, you know, the, uh, the question was always why. And the dramatists were, were left out. So the, the objective was, for me, was why not include the dramatists and why not put it on television as a TV movie um, for everyone to see? So they saw it right away. Like, we make it fast, and we actually had a, had a voice in the questioning of, like, why did Columbine happen? And that didn't go over very well because um, the TV stations were worried. They were... They were in threat of being shut down by Clinton because of just violence on TV, like police shows with guns, was being targeted as the, as the reason why. So nobody was going to make Columbine as an experiment. And so I was sort of, you know, that was, I was continuing to try and find a home for this idea. And through uh, um, Diane Keaton um, at... Through my, we, I had my agent also had Diane Keaton as a client, and he had a dinner with us, where I explained to Diane this idea, and she said, "Let's take it to HBO," and she became the producer. And we went to Colin Callender at the time was the head of HBO Films, and we told them that what we wanted to do this idea, and he said that I can't do Columbine, but I can do Elephant, and Elephant was. Uh, the Alan Clark film, which was made in, for BBC in 1989 as a, as a, uh, um, also a reaction to violence between uh, Protestant and Catholic um, people in, 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 during the Troubles in 1989. At the peak of the violence, he made this film and they put it on the BBC. So he really knew what we were up to. He worked at the BBC at the time 
And Danny Boyle was actually a co-director of Elephant, the original Elephant. Um, so I asked him if we could use the title. <laughs> Mostly, like, Colin was the guy. He always referred to it as Elephant. So we had sort of inherited the title through Cal uh, Colin. Harmony Korean also said that um, Elephant was his favorite movie. So we asked him to write the script. And I think a year went by, and Harmony didn't write anything. So we decided to find a different writer. At the time, I was communicating with uh, an author named J.T. Leroy, who was this very strange story, almost a Kenneth Anger story or something. Uh, a write, a it was an impersonated like, character writing stories out of San Francisco. And so J.T. Leroy wrote a version of the script. And after Jerry, Jerry played in Sundance, and um, it was the moment where we want, you know, uh, we received a screenplay from JT for Elephant, which was pretty, you know, by the book. It was a little boring. It was, it was a little corny. So I decided to, like, also use no screenplay for Elephant and, like, do it, like, in the fashion of, um, of Jerry. And also I was certain that um, HBO wasn't going to be interested in this idea of um, no screenplay um, and non, you know, no, not famous actors. I explained it'll be in black and white. It'll be very slow. It'll be very austere. And um, it, um, it'll make you go to sleep. You know, I was really underplaying it. I was trying to get out of the job because I had gotten JT a job. He got paid. And that was the whole point of it. And I was trying to, like, exit out of the project. And so Colin said, well, we know that you're trying to get out of this project. But this is a very, uh, we think this project needs something, uh, something new. And this is a perfect idea. I was like, okay. So um, I guess we're, we're doing it still. So I, you know, piece by piece, I, um, I said, okay, well, let's see if we can find the kids that we like. So we, we were casting the kids at the same time as I was kind of like working on uh, a style and a story. And um, I showed them Jerry, and I said, this is what it's going to look like. And I said, fine. So they kept saying yes, because I think HBO at the time, um, it was, uh, let's see, um, 2002, they, they really didn't have any, very, any filmmakers working that they liked. They had, you know, they had relatively um, staid programming and biographical things, and it was, they had their comedy specials, but it was a little different than it is now. I mean, now HBO, they did have The Sopranos, but, you know, they, the film division was a little bit um, conservative. So they were trying, you know, also our, our budget was very tiny compared to these other films, so they, for them it was not hard to give us, like, three million dollars. Um, so we so slowly went into this, and um, um, made the film, showed it to Colin. Uh, halfway through screening it, he started playing with the lamp, the lamp next to him. He wasn't watching the screen. He was just playing with this lamp for like a half an hour. And I thought, okay, he doesn't like it. But what he, was, he said he was doing at the end of the screening was just trying to figure out how to, how to present it. You know, um, and, I, and it was, I guess, his idea to go to Cannes. And it was just an ordinary, um, ordinary. It was a, it was a nice trip, trip to Cannes, but we had really had no idea that it would catch on, and it was a surprise. Uh, thank you so much. I, I will stop the questions here in order to that the people can can uh, we can participate in a Q and A for 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 Gus. Uh, gracias. Thanks. So okay. So she he's he's going to take the. Por favor. I, I, I don't hear anything. Hello, hello. Hi, Mr. Vincent, here. here thank you. Hello, hello. No está escuchando. No. Okay, he's going to do it in English. Oh, okay. So, 
Hi, Mr. Ramson. Thank you for being here. Uh, could you talk a little bit uh, more about the, the method you prefer to use with your actors when you're directing them? I mean, do you make a lot of previous readings? You like to rehearse or you don't, if it's the case, or you try to improve new new things on the set every day how do you work how do you relate with your actors with your cast thank you uh usually i i try to get to know them as well as i can uh, sometimes depending on the actor like they're very like into sort of getting to know each other very well so that you're like when you get to the set it's um you know your friends and you can communicate and you're like um so usually that works out Occasionally, you know, there's a distance. Occasionally, that's too intimate for the, for the actor, um, just to have dinner and to, like, talk on the phone. Uh, but generally, like, that's the um, first step. Um, ta you're always talking about the project. You're talking about things that relate to the project. Maybe you're talking about the character. I tend to not talk about the character. I talk about people that are like the character, but I don't necessarily talk about the character. Um, because I'm like letting them come up with their ideas about the character. Um, let's see. Um, then the next step is like when you know you're scheduled to shoot. There'll be a, f a few weeks, maybe two weeks, where the actor arrives, and before the first day of shooting, and you're um, you're doing different things. You're we are rehearsing. Well, I'll put a aside a couple of hours two or three hours each day for rehearsals. And the rest of the day, the characters are um, maybe doing costumes or, um, you know, or just meetings, general meetings, or they're working with themselves um, together. Um, so there's that period. And during the rehearsals, I think Drugstore Cowboy was the first time I had a traditional rehearsal. We, um, so it would have been like the four main people there's Heather Graham, James Legro, Kelly Lynch, Matt Dillon. So we'd sit around the table and choose scenes to do, read through it. We would also, because of that group, um, we also just went off the page. They would just improv things. Because they were, it would amuse them. They liked that, all four of them. That's also something that sometimes actors like shy away from. Like they want to go from the page and stay on the page. But in the case of Drugstore Cowboy, they would just go off. And I think for out, I mean, I remember getting up and getting in a car and driving to a uh, uh, drugstore with the, with the characters and having them be in character. And I remember we, we had a fender bender. We had a car accident on the way to the drugstore, and the characters dealt with it, like, in character and talked to the other, to the other uh, person driving, and they were all in character. And Kelly was, like, yelling at Matt because they were a married couple, and um, I found that very useful to just... And they found it very... I guess they found it useful. It was very entertaining. It was funny. Um, so by the time we got on the set, they could just sort of be the characters, and it was... There was a, a lot of dialogue in that screenplay, probably because of my um, newness to adapt, adapting screenplays. Um, just huge blocks of dialogue. Um, which I think was good for Matt's character, because in general, he, he was a man of few words, but all of a sudden, Drugstore Cowboy, he, he was a blabbermouth. You know? um, so there is that period, that rehearsal period. During the shoot, I'm, I'm usually just like trying to indulge the actors. I'm, um, I'm trying to just say yes all the time, almost, which isn't good because then they get used to that and they expect anything like a, like training <laughs> training a, a dog <laughs> you know, like you know too many treats um, so I can run into trouble but I do like to sort of they come up with ideas and I usually go like yeah do it yeah of course do that do that, do that. so the, it helps them I think um, unless you spoil them too much it helps the actors um, feel like they have part they're they're helping they're creating as opposed to just saying the lines and leaving the room, they're actually part of the whole process. 
and it's um, you know they they get excited and they work they seem to work harder. Oh. Hi, Gus. Here, Fernanda for Top Cinema. I wanted to ask precisely about uh, "Don't Worry, He Won't Go Far on Fit." Um, why did you decide to tell the story about Callahan? I think uh, it's probably one of my favorite movies from the last few years. It's a very interesting story. I think it's a story that everyone needs to to hear. But how did you get involved with this project? Thanks. Um, that was a project where um, Robin Williams, after doing Goodwill Hunting, he and his wife, they had a production company, Marsha Williams, and it was at, um, I can't remember, I think it was Sony, and um, they had these, these, these books that they had bought. One was called Kid, which was a Dan Savage book about uh, a gay couple adopting a, a kid in uh, Portland, Oregon. They were both Portland, Oregon stories that they sent me. So it was Kid, and then there was Don't Worry, He Won't Get Far on Foot, which was John Callahan's story, novel that he'd written in uh, uh, 89, I think, or 88. And so I, I knew John personally. I hadn't read the book, but I knew that it exist, existed. I knew his story because there was sort of like cartoons that he would do in the news, local newspaper that would sort of be about the same story, about his alcoholism, his accident, his recovery, uh, physical recovery, then his also alcohol recovery in cartoons that he would do. So I kind of knew the idea. I read the book and um, I said, yeah, let's work on Don't Worry. So along with Robin Williams and Marsha Williams, we developed uh, a few screenplays. We wrote... Um, I think four drafts. And it was um, always sort of hitting a wall. I think, I think it was challenging for Sony or for whoever was going to fund it to like, let Robin do a, one of his own projects that they felt wasn't, um, you know, might have, um, may not be like um, what they wanted, you know, maybe too difficult for them to like, um, to envision as a moneymaker. And um, so, so I never really knew what was happening behind the curtain, but n it never sort of came about. And then years went by, and Robin died in 2012, and all, uh, somewhere around there, uh, Sony called, and they had the property. They had bought the book for Robin, and they wanted to know if I wanted to, like, revisit it. And that's, that's kind of, like, where it came from. Also... Uh, Callahan had died, but he, we, we wrote the first four drafts with him. We were always hanging out with John and sort of asking him questions. So I knew a lot about John. We interviewed him. I had tapes of John talking. So uh, we eventually made it. Um, and it was, it was very truthful to the book. It was, a, it was sort of like going back to Drugstore Cowboy, just trying to make John's uh, voice in the book come alive. Hi, Mr. President. I, you just spoke about the process of goodwill hunting, but I wanted to ask you what does it, the movie personally means to you and what memories will you keep of Robin Williams? Too fast. Sorry. Uh, you spoke about the process of making goodwill hunting, but what does this movie mean to you and what personal memories will you keep of Robin Williams? Um, well, I mean, it, there comes a point usually in, in every movie that the, the, sometimes the attraction to a subject means something to you. Um, there's one particular thing that means something to you, or maybe there's a group of things. But as you progress, um, uh, who said it? Um, I think Truffaut said, um, you know, making a movie is like a trip through the Old West on a stagecoach. You hope for a, for a pleasant trip, but by the end, you're just praying that you, that you stay alive. 
I mean, so those initial like sort of reasons that you make things sometimes disappear, or many many times disappear because new, either new reasons or new problems, or you know, going into the middle of the the psychology of the characters isn't necessarily um, what you were originally uh, touched by. You know, it changes. Everything changes. So you're, at the end, you're just hoping to finish the film, and your intentions are kind of shot, and everything's like, you know, everything changes. So a Good Will Hunting, I think. I mean, it was obvious to me. It was a. It was gimmicky in the sense that the guy was this brilliant genius, and we were expected to believe that the janitor is answering the questions on the board, which which was in which was inspired by um, Ben Affleck's father, Tim Affleck, who worked as a janitor at Harvard and who could have answered maybe the questions on certain, you know, in certain departments, boards, uh, but he was somehow stuck as a janitor and the kids would ask him, why are you the janitor? You're a genius. We know you're a genius. You worked with David Wheeler at his theatrical company and you're like, the in-house genius, and he said, well, somebody has to do this job. And he was being very um, uh, dutiful and socialistic, and like somebody, this is a good job. This is an important job. Somebody needs to push the broom. And he was, in fact, hiding something. Tim Affleck was hiding um, a drinking problem, and nobody really knew. Uh, so this idea that... Um, the character was very smart, but he had, you know, something that he was hiding, something he was holding on to, um, as a, secretly, and people even knew. His friends even knew. In the case of Will, he was hiding that he didn't want anything to change. He didn't want to grow up. He wanted to just always be with his friends. He didn't want to mature, um, even though he was like had distinct possibilities. So that was very. The gimmick worked on me. I, I, I saw a lot of things in it. I saw the psychology of the character. I, um, I fell for it. And, you know, they really, um, they were kind of working in writing the script to kind of, like, make that, um, you know, that character and his evolution, you know, the main attraction of the story. And um, um, that, was, that was what it meant to me. The, uh, the other question. What was? Oh, Robin Williams. Um, yeah, Robin. I mean, was incredibly um, funny on set, um, as he would be. <clears throat> he had a habit of, of if he was here, of course, you guys would be laughing the whole time. He needs to have you laugh. He needs, and as you laugh, it fuels him to make you laugh harder. So I think he he was a man who who could actually kill people with laughter, you know, like, because they wouldn't be able to breathe. They would be laugh, laughing so hard. So he was sort of like that. Either he, that was on, or he was like this. So he was very quiet, silent, or he was, like, trying to make you laugh. If you talked to him seriously about a subject, he was very smart. If you were as smart as he would was, which I wasn't, um, you could engage him about art or math or, you know, so I never really had those types of relationships with him. Usually, he was, he was uh, morose. And I think if people have told me that there's a reason for that. I'm not sure. I think pot, partly in my case, it might have been he didn't want me to think that he was going to be Mr. Mr. Jokester, that he was a serious actor. And he didn't want to like make me laugh. I was trying to crack jokes, which he didn't find funny. But he, he would never crack, encouraging him to crack jokes when we were alone. When we were on set, the crew was there. So he'd like the focus puller, he'd see him sitting there and he'd start cracking jokes for that guy. Then the cameraman would laugh and then all of a sudden the whole crew would be laughing as we were working. And um, I remember David Cronenberg came, we were shooting in Canada. He came to the set to visit and it was since it was a Canadian crew, Cronenberg knew all these, these crew members. And he was standing, it was after lunch, and Robin was making the crew laugh. And David 
said out loud, wow, it is noisy in here. And all of a sudden, Robin shut up. Like he knew that the director, a different director, had made like sort of an announcement. And I said, yeah, it's like different guy, different director. So he, so there was that side. There was, um, uh, when I was working with him, um, I usually, um, when, I'm, when I'm directing, I usually just kind of, either I get, get, the, um, get the shot and move on, or with Robin, he always wanted to do like a funny one, a sad one, a fast one, a slow one, a medium one. I think in an effort to give you a lot of ma thing, material so you could choose the right one that was gonna work for the scene. Um, but I generally don't give like specific directions, but Robin was smart enough to just read your slight facial expressions, very slight, and he would read your mind. He would know what you liked. He would know if you were happy or not without talking. Um, so those are the things I remember. You mentioned earlier in your career that the template for modern film and the rules of engagement uh, for film, for cinema, do you feel like that as a filmmaker in the current changes in platforms, smaller screens, people watch on their phones, et cetera, et cetera, it, that that's impacted you as a filmmaker, other filmmakers, and how? And then my second question would be, you know, what are you called to next, you know, in this very rapidly changing, uh, you know, social and political world that we all live in? Uh, what kind of subject matter might you be drawn to next? Thank you. Um, yeah, the, yeah, the whole, like, impact of um, just, I, I think of it as the, um, you know, the computer on not only filmmaking, but on every aspect of our lives um, has been huge in many different ways politically. I mean, everything politically is like very, very tenuous and scary and um, unbelievable. And um, there, there's that aspect, which just translating to, cine, you know, the sort of cinematic world it's, um, yeah, people are watching so many different types of things um, that whenever I see a young person looking at their phone and laughing and or just only looking at their phone, I always kind of want to see what, the, what it is. And if I ask or, or look at what they're watching, it's something very, very odd. Like um, in one case, it was... Uh, just a woman in a um, uh, an SUV that had a pink interior, and she was eating uh, vegetarian food for the first time and making a face, you know, and that was hilarious to them. And that that the sort of what cinema is to like a certain generation and or like to the modern day is has changed and uh, or is changing that storytelling isn't necessarily the main attraction it's been going that direction for so long and we all I think we all sort of um, watched it you know going on I think that independent filmmakers were always hoping for the downfall of the Hollywood stranglehold and that now that it actually is falling you realize that you're part of it <laughs> it's been pulling you in with it um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's um, streaming and the influence of, say, Netflix and Amazon. I've made an Amazon film. It's confusing in the sense that their idea of what they're doing with the movie, where it's going, what it's for, is not the same as the old time. Like, we're going to put it in a theater and people are going to come and watch the movie in a theater. The theaters are all dying. Um, the attractions in theaters are action-oriented. Um, action, obviously, is dominating. Um, they're willing... I mean, I think that a lot of times Hollywood has been sort of misled by its own sort of successes. You know, if they, if they make 
a $300 million movie and advertise it for th another $300 million, and it makes, you know, $800 million, they're happy, but you're kind of like feeling, or at least from my point of view, it seems like a risky, risky venture. It like, seems very strange. But it does sort of mirror other types of ventures, you know, like architecturally or... Um, politically or other types of things that are kind of overkill and, um, you know, um, overgrown. Um, but this, the streaming aspect is odd. Like, where does that film go? Where does Don't Worry, You Won't Get Far and Put? I'm happy to see it's here, and I have, I'm happy to see that maybe it had a run in the theaters here. But it's, it's no longer the main event. You know, the, the dramatic film or comedic film or even action film they're sort of no longer, they're competing with games, sports, uh, uh, people buying stuff. They're competing with so many things that they never did before that is kind of, it's very much changing. And it's sometimes um, uh, distracting and makes you feel sad, but then other times you, you acclimate, you know? So I'm, I'm trying to acclimate. Uh, we have time for one last question. Mr. Vincent. I just, um, what I'm drawn to is usually a character that's in the middle of an environment that I've, the most exciting thing is an environment I've never heard of. You know, so if it's say, I mean, a lot of times it's, um, you know, it's just like an environment I would never expect that, or wouldn't, don't, don't know about and would never expect existed, say, I don't know, it could be anything like horse racing or space exploration or shoe sales, toy salesman. Vince Vaughn had a toy salesman script. They thought, it's the world of toy, toy makers and toy sales. It's, it's an environment I have no idea, but it's very established. It could be almost anything, but when... When you're describing the environment along with the character, it's um, um, information, it's new information, it's um, educational and exciting and interesting. Eh, Mr. Bassant, eh, hi. Eh, Gonzalo Hurtado de Cine para Llevar. Eh, you, you, his character moves between marginality and incomprehension. Eh, what's, uh, is, what, what is uh, fascinating about them? Which, which film? Uh, others. Other, other his characters. All of the characters? Yeah, sure. They move between... Uh, marginality and yeah. incomprehension. I mean, that was... And, and what? Incomprehension. Incomprehension? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, the marginality, I think, is part of that, like, you know, it's a new environment that you haven't... The marginal side is like, you did, you, we've never seen that world. I mean, a lot of times, yeah, they're like marginal in the sense, marginal in their relationship to society, because I think that's my own personal view of my own relationship to the world. But um, incomprehension. Is that the right word? You got the wrong word, I think. Incomprehension. You mean... Yeah, nobody them. Oh, I see, yeah. They don't have the ability to come. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that's just my own relationship to to the world. 